What I would like to say is the following. So yes, I, I agree with both of the previous uh, comments, especially with the study looking at high carbohydrates, they're talking about the wrong carbohydrates, right? So they're usually, and especially in that population of 60 and older in, in, in the standard American diet in a study, they're not eating beans and, and you know complex carbohydrates. They're eating, usually eating and measuring simple, uh, uh, simple refined carbohydrates. But going to this omega-3 issue, you know, what we do in our practice for the last, which since the testing has been available for the last 10 years, is that since we convert all our patients to a plant-based diet, and everybody's been told to eat more, you know, omega-3 foods, right? Like walnuts and flax and chia and hemp, all great, which is what we do, is that we can actually measure not just the omega-3 index, like their total score, but we like to actually measure the conversion of the omega-3s, right? So we can look at delta-60 saturase enzymes, we can look at all the other B vitamins, magnesium, uh, and, and zinc, all the B vitamins that actually will help the conversion from ALA all the way to EPA to DHA. So this is where when people actually eat a whole food plant-based diet, which will help everything, but there's going to be a large part of the population where we have sometimes conversion issues. It's not that they're vegan, but when we actually study those patients, because I have a lot of people who will eventually see me and they already have followed these two wonderful physicians. They're already whole food plant-based. So it's all hardcore. Great, 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 great. But then when we look at them and then we test their nutrition, their nutrition is off. Now, why is it? Are they not eating correctly? No, they're not eating correctly. They're actually eating the best diet possible. However, they have to look at other things like their microbiome and actually look at conversion issues because most of these people will have some kind of increased intestinal permeability issue or other aspects that are going on that is making this wonderful diet not really as supportive or effective in that individual. So yes, we still want people to eat a whole food plant-based diet. And yes, we do test everybody. And then we can see, like in my practice clinically, we have about 20% of the people coming in, regardless of vegan or not, will have conversion issues. And for those patients, I will then recommend a plant-based oil. In fact, I actually helped one of the companies do that six years ago, which is a major supplier now of, the, of these algae oils. But for the other 80% that I see clinically, I'm like, hey, just eat more of these things and we have to fix the nutritional deficiencies. And then all of a sudden your body will metabolically convert correctly. And so we can measure that. So I do agree with what they've said before. We just now had to kind of individualize. Otherwise, you know, the media will say, oh, this is a problem or vegans have this problem. Now, also going to the question of dementia in a vegan population. So it's not just the diet, you know? So again, we see patients as well. And, you know, we have these patients where who've moved over and they still end up having some type of dementia or cognitive disorder. But we also see then again, microbiome problems problems with them. We also see nutritional deficiencies still with them. We also see food sensitivities with them causing inflammation in the brain. And more importantly, we're now actually seeing a lot of environmental toxicity, unfortunately, which is getting worse over time, right? Because we're all getting exposed to, uh, like Dr. Furman mentioned, and all the waterways and the food and the environment. And so when we see a, a cognitive uh, patient that has a problem, they actually, in our practice, have a higher rate and risk, just like certain cancers have a higher rate and risk of having certain types of exposures environmentally. So, so I, don't, I don't want everybody to feel like, oh, I did this diet and it failed because they got dementia. It's like, no, they're doing the best they can, but we now have to look at the other contributing causes that also cause inflammation in the brain or toxicity into the brain or cognitive decline or even cardiovascular problems. So just to be clear, so very specifically, what exactly should we do to avoid ever getting dementia? I, mean, I guess it's my turn. Blood, check your blood pressure, know your hemoglobin A1C, know your lipid numbers, um, make, make sure you don't have sleep apnea, avoid atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a big contributor to dementia. Um, well, I, and I would supplement and maintain a high omega-3 index, you know, in the normal range, but not walk around uh, low. That would be what I would do. And I would have good parents that didn't have APOE4 that they gave me. For our standpoint, we always want to optimize on top of everything he just said, just to optimize looking at, is there any other toxicities? Is there any other inflammatory triggers, even in the plant-based diet? Because we can have sensitivities to food that also trigger chronic inflammation. Also hydration, exercise, social ability, you know, keeping the cognitive function going because we know that social isolation and not having interaction actually increases also these risks. So some people can be eating a plant-based diet. If they're living by themselves, they have a higher risk. So there's other things that we can also be doing as a just a general lifestyle in addition to diet that can help with lowering dementia. Well, I, um, I agree with the most of what was said, but I'll highlight maybe the few couple of things I disagree with. Um, one is that they convert, that I don't think it's possible in, the, in people who have a very low um, omega-3 index to manipulate their, their supplements or their nutritional deficiencies or anything to bring them up to a high level without giving them supplemental EPA and DHA. Yeah. That's been yeah. an experimentally 
um, unproven. And and I've been practicing that for years and years and watching people who are using all kinds of nutritional, supplemental, gymnastics, and dietary modifications. That in people, are, it's, it's mostly a genetically determined um, ability to convert ALA to EPA and DHA adequately. And some people on a vegan diet can convert adequately and many people cannot. And you're not going to take the majority who cannot and manipulate their, their supplements or any of their diet to enable them to convert that because it's a genetically determined issue. So I want to disagree with that, um, Dr. Pai. But in any case, it's so critically important and you can't just fix it and expect the brain to be fixed because it takes decades of having an adequate omega-3 index. You're, it's your lifetime exposure to salt that determines your risk of hemorrhagic stroke, not what you add in the last five years of your life. And it's your lifetime exposure to a favorable DHA index that takes decades of having a good level that may maximize cognition who are living over the age of 90. And we're talking about people advocating a what I, you know, a super healthy diet, plant-based diet, what I call a nutritarian diet. So now we have people living longer with the, pro with the ability to live to be 90 to 100 years old. So now shrinkage of the brain becomes a major element, which wouldn't matter if the person was eating healthfully because they're going to die shorter lifespans anyway. So what I'm saying is it's important for us nutritarian, super healthy eaters to make sure we're having adequate brain function so that we get more physical and brain um, health in our later years. And that has to be established in middle ages. We need to pay attention to the omega-3 index and to make sure if you're trying any other ma manipulation to get it up there, make sure it's going up there by measuring it with the omega-3 index at your levels above six, let's say, to make sure you're keeping it above six for most of your life if you want to have um, good cognition in later life. That's not the major cause of dementia. The major cause of dementia is eating junk food and eating an unhealthy diet. And which we're not doing. So that's the major cause. And we're talking about healthy eaters now, the major cause. But the other issue was zinc, because zinc is poorly absorbed from plant foods. And the combination of zinc deficiency and omega 3 fatty acid deficiencies could exacerbate dementia formation, because zinc is li linked to immunosenescence and neurosenescence, it's meaning you have more de um, more. Um, aging of the immune system and, and the brain and the brain's ability of cells to communicate and brain function when you're um, when you're zinc deficient. But in any case, obviously B12 is very important, but most people know about that. That's why we're not talking about that. But the issue, but the interaction between those three nutrients are critically important to maintain, protect against dementia. And that's B12, DHA, and, um, and, of course, and zinc, but we want it to happen for a long period of time, not to ask the people to do this once they pass, once they're 75 or 80 years old, we want them to have these numbers be positive um, and when they're younger, because it takes, because the brain is neurologic tissue and neurologic tissue is not that, doesn't change that rapidly. So you have to get your, it's not just getting your index up. You want your index favorable for years or decades to maintain adequate brain health. And the last thing is, I also, I agree with almost everything Dr. Khan says, except for the fact that I've had a huge experience taking care of the most seriously ill people who are on their deathbed in hospitals, who have 20% ejection fractions, who've had heart attacks, poor oxygenation, the most severe cases who are reversing their successfully get out of the hospital when they allow them, us to change their diet with, with advanced diabetes, people that they try to cardiovert them, they couldn't get out of irregular heartbeats. And I'm saying that I didn't give them an ultra fat diet to think that's better. I think the ultra low fat diet increases the, this, this person at risk of cardiac arrhythmia or has cardiac arrhythmia. If this doesn't give you beneficial effects, you can control their calories, you can still give them fat adequacy and having both the ALA adequacy from nuts and seeds, particularly the high omega-3 nuts and seeds we're talking about, walnuts, flax seeds, hemp seeds, and, and um, chia seeds, with the exposure to algae oil for EPA and DHA, that combination with a low enough caloric intake to allow for weight loss and fat loss and cholesterol reversal actually enhances the cardiovascular recovery. It doesn't weaken it. So there's never a case where I personally would agree with this ultra fat fear to take people off all fats to accelerate reversal of cardiovascular disease. Cause I'd seen, I've had so many, and I gave some cases of that. I've given cases in my experience and my cases are just as important as other people's cases who are more famous. They, my study may be better. They have better, better pictures and more, you know, better. My study may not be as good, but it's still, um, I have more patient experience and I, most of my career have been so busy seeing patients you know, 90 hours a week that I haven't produced all the great studies, but I still have a study with 450 people whose blood pressure dropped 26 points with nine case histories of, you know, not 25 case histories, but uh, nine cases, but I have, you know, hundreds of case histories that I, but in any case, um, there's 500 of such cases on my website, but, but 
in any case, I'm saying that it's still my experience and input is that we can, that the healthiest diet for a person with even advanced cardiovascular disease includes some degree of nuts and seeds. Of course, we pay attention to only with mealtime, half an ounce with each meal, not high levels of them. That's going to increase their caloric exposure. We still want them to lose weight at a rapid weight. And I'm just putting it out there as what my findings have been. So I'd like to just uh, come back to, to one of the comments that was said because about, about nutritional gymnastics, because, yes. uh, you know, we train our patients, right? For example, and when we look at the nutrition, we're actually looking at, you know, we can see whether that enzyme of Delta 60 saturates is either functional or impaired. Now, if it's impaired, then yes, then, then supplementation would be important for that patient. But when it's not impaired and it is functional and they're eating a low amount, they still have difficulty with conversion with the, defic the deficiencies of certain nutrients. And we can then measure post their omega-3 index increasing by doing such things. So I just want to clarify that for the record. Sure. You're not saying people practice. have a low index, you know, for some kind of genetically low index. You're saying the people who have an adequate desaturation enzyme, better nutrition, better intake of, of ALA and, and, and restriction of omega-6 and other accessory fats. That's why we don't give people oil. It's one of the reasons to take the oil out of the diet because the high omega-6 fats from all the oil increases, reduces conversion of omega-3 to, to long-chain DHA and EPA. So I, I understand what you're saying to a degree. So comment on oils, including coconut oil and coconut butter. Uh, where do you stand with all that, just to be clear? I'll jump in. I mean, I would not advise coconut oil, coconut butter, because of the 85% saturated fat content. Uh, generally, it will raise LDL cholesterol significantly, which is not to be promoted despite Dr. Cousins' comment. Uh, there is some data for intestinal permeability, also known as leaky gut, that coconut oil favors injury to the gut lining. And then you can get something called a metabolic endotoxemia, which is basically a lot of crap in your intestines having the potential to enter your body and create inflammation. So I don't find any role for it. Uh, I don't want to you know, create an enormous controversy, but I'm impressed by an ongoing study in Spain called Cordioprev that is studying two versions of the Mediterranean diet, high in olive oil and low in olive oil, distinctive for including 1,002 heart patients. It's the largest randomized study of actually patients with atherosclerosis. And the high olive oil arm had to be ended early because there was so much benefit in reducing heart attack, stroke, and death, along with endothelial function, along with carotid plaque regression. Um, it's easy to say, but they're not a vegan population. And how would they have done if they ate a low-fat plant diet or a moderate whole food plant fat diet and not done their Spanish version? But I think people should study the Cordioprev series of literature uh, recognizing that the endothelial function studies that were done in normal volunteers that are so often quoted at these conferences had 18 or 20 people that were healthy. And here we have a study of over a thousand actual heart patients where they clearly were not harmed by extra virgin olive oil. They actually had uh, you know, peer reviewed published data that their situation was enhanced. And I know that's an unpopular situation, but uh, for me to take, but it's certainly consistent with the Mediterranean diet with Dr. Walter Longo and his longevity diet, which is almost completely plant-based, but it's certainly uh, by no means oil-free. Likewise, likewise, reinforcing what you're saying, the Prevamid study showed that the longest lifespan, lowest risk of cardiovascular death, were people eating nuts and seeds before the study started, who were then randomized to the group that were told to eat nuts and seeds. And those group, that was the group that lived the longest. And the, that was supported by the, the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study too, which, saw, which, which, which tracked every type of protein, animal protein, plant protein, which type of plant protein, beans versus nuts. And they, they always track the fact that the removal of animal protein, the substitution of nuts and seeds shows the most benefits for longevity and cardiovascular death reduction. So the, why, why this is comment is relevant is because oil is fattening compared to nuts and seeds and the oil rushes into your bloodstream faster and you get a high level of calories in the blood, which you don't, so you, it's so body weight plays a huge issue here. And if a person is gonna get well, they need lower body fat. And it's just so hard to get a low body fat when people are using oils, where the judicious amount of nuts and seeds still allow people to continue to lose weight at a rapid rate, where the oil is, is inhibiting of weight loss. And so, and the Prevamid study also, and as the, and other studies have shown that 
the low fat arm and the lowest didn't do as well as the arm that had even some oil in it in many of these cases because their diet might have been too low in fat. But if you're using some fat, then of course, nuts and seeds are the way to go, not any type of oil. I would like to say that just to answer the question about the coconut oil. Yes, we recommend people to avoid it as much as possible. It's not a superfood as they might advertise it in the health stores and people are just taking it like by tubs of that. And so yeah, we'll see all sorts of plant-based people that will kind of follow something on the social media or the internet or hear something. And then all of a sudden their lipid panel will just go extremely off the chart. Uh, and that's the only addition uh, or change in their diet. So we definitely recommended uh, to our patients as well to reduce the, the coconut oil as much as possible uh, in their diet. And then it's not something that they should supplement with. And what about olives and avocados? Is that part of a diet you recommend or recommend avoiding? Uh, if I, if you're talking to me, um, I don't recommend, I don't need to avoid avocados. And if a person that has a, uh, um, enough, if is fit enough and thin enough to handle those calories, I mean, we do modify the, we do control the fat calories so that they're not going to eat too many calories. So calories do matter from any food you eat. But in any case, what I'm saying is that avocados have been shown to be diabetic friendly, cardiovascular friendly, they're cancer friendly, they're, they're healthy foods. We don't need to avoid them. But in some overweight people, we're having have less, we're having a certain moderate amount of nuts and seeds, not an unlimited amount. They're not snacking on them and they're not putting nuts and seeds and an avocado in the same meal. They're having a half an avocado or nuts and seeds. In other words, they're still moderate. We're still keep, keeping control of the overall amount of food they're eating. Because you just because a food is okay doesn't mean an unlimited amount of that food is okay, you know. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Like we we have our patients do the same. We want to uh I utilize avocados, seeds, and nuts all the time. So I, I, I do I do have no problem with that. We don't see that clinically in my practice. But what we also do is I totally agree with uh, Dr. Furman here is that if, if someone is having a weight issue and they're trying to lose weight on a plant-based diet, then I do cut back down on some of that. Because, you know, av who doesn't love avocados in a way, right? So I could eat probably a lot more than I should. But that's something that, yeah, just additional fat calories because calories are calories in that way. I have uh, those patients cut down a little bit more on those. But I don't have them restricted off of it because of the health benefits. Right. I'll just say it's interesting. There's a, a lot of studies on olive oil and endothelial function, cardiac function, a lot on avocados, often funded by the avocado industry, unfortunately, nuts and seeds. Very hard to find olive studies. So presumably, they're probably pretty endothelial and cardiac friendly. They have an amazing family of phytonutrients unique to olives. Even the olive leaf is a tremendous blood pressure lowering uh, source of nutrients. But it is hard to quote the science about, you know, eating three or four or five olives a day and the impact on cardiovascular health. It's probably positive, but not with the avocados and with the nuts and seeds. <laughs> yeah. Share it around, you know, diversity. It's good for the microbiome to see different foods. And the other thing I would ask, uh, like to say is about, about oils in general, just in terms of like the, the purity of an oil, that varies from every, every place. So if you're looking at a study that's done, say, in Spain, they actually may have access to actually real olive oil. And, you know, most of the things that people are getting, there's tons of studies showing out about adulteration and problems with that. So that's also skews some of this health benefit, possibly, if there is some, to have some oils. It's because, you know, most of these things have been adulterated with corn oil and other type of soil and other things as, as many uh, independent labs have shown. So again, we're kind of moving away even from the real food. And, and that once it becomes a mass product or there's industry behind it, then it's kind of been pushed like this is a health, something healthy. But we actually can look back and probably say on some of these things, it's not even the real olive oil that, that, are, that, that people actually get to use.